Live from Brooklyn, it's Monday night. <laughs> and I'd love to introduce the crew to you. First off, we have Mr. Donald Culp from Columbus, Ohio. If you want to mute yourself and say hi, that's fine. Hello. Okay. <laughs> now mute yourself again. <laughs> and then we have Mr. Uh, John Tudor down in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, hello, everyone. And then we have Mr. Michael Lewis. Is Dana there? She is not. She's in the other room, but she will be here shortly. Okay, well, we have Mike and Dana from uh, near pa from near Pasadena, Texas, like anybody knows where Pasadena is, uh, near Houston. Houston. Planet Houston. Planet Houston. Hey, Dana. Hey, brother. And finally, back to Brooklyn, where I'm still dodging bullets. And the car horns. Oh, well. So, um, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this night. I thank you for the words that's going to get taught and just how sweet a thing the word is when you know it and understand it and operate it in your life. And I thank you for each and every individual here because I know that's their goal. And I thank you for just blessing us and watching over us. And Father, if there's any physical needs, I just thank you that you've taken care of those. And if there's any financial needs, you take care of those. And if there's any spiritual needs, you take care of those as well. Because you're a great and loving Father. And we got a great big wonderful brother who's working with you to, to get us to the places we need to be. And I thank you for this in your son's name. Amen. Okie dokie. Um, what we're doing tonight is there's an old video that we did. And the quality of the video is not that great. So what I wanted to do is um, do another video. And not only are we going to re it's not only for replacing the video for the quality, I expanded on it a little bit because I was limited to only 15 minutes. Uh, there it is. I was limited to only 15 minutes at the time. Um, there was a reason for it, not sure why, but I was limited. So in any case, Mr. Michael, will you please bring up the blog? All right. I would like to start looking at a scripture we looked at last week. Of course, this was many moons ago, so we didn't look at this scripture last week, I don't believe. 1 Timothy 2, 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Before this, it talks about praying for kings and governors and all that. So that's what's good and acceptable in the sight of God, and he wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The last part of verse 4 says, come to the knowledge of the truth. So there must be truth that we can find or come unto. So then the question comes, where do we find this truth? It can't be a relative thing. There is no truth that changes from one person to another. Truth cannot become a thing that changes. Truth is defined as a true or actual state of matter. He tried to find out the truth. Conformity with fact or reality, verified uh, variety, variety, whatever that word is, the truth of the statement a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle, or the like, mathematical truths, the state of a character being true 
actuality or actual actual existence. Math presents the best example. Two plus two is four. It is not three. If you decide it's three or five, that isn't a separate truth. It is plain wrong. And you find this within religion all over the place. They decide something is the truth, and then that becomes the truth, even though the word does not document it that way. Uh, the word of God, like math, does not have one truth for you and another truth for me. You are either saved by believing God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, or you aren't. Now, there may be things you need to understand so it does not contradict other scriptures. We either are saved by grace in this age, or we aren't. And Ephesians says we are. So, where are we looking to go to find the truth that God is talking about? Look at 1 Timothy 2.15. Study to show that this is all going to be from the King Jimmy, by the way. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. The word study means to put forth a diligent effort. We are to put forth a diligent effort into rightly dividing the word of God. Everyone divides the word of God. The question is, do they do it right? Do they rightly divide it? Let's look at the ESV for a clear understanding of the scripture. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved who worked, who, had, who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's the rightly dividing of that word. Now, uh, most of the translation of the Greek word spudazo, which is the Greek word translated from, is to be diligent or to put, in, put forth an effort. In fact, the Greek word is used 11 times. This is the only place it is translated study. It's uh, translated endeavor, do diligent, be diligent, give diligence, be forward, labor, and study. It is our, you know, I can understand how they came up with the word study. I mean, it's not an, an, a, an exact translation, but it, you know, to rightly divide the word, you're going to have to look at it. It is our job to dig into God's word. That requires work. I know that's a four-letter word, but it's a good word, four-letter word. Not like some of the other ones. We have no choice but to go to the ancient words to find the truth. Please never think of the Bible as a stuffy old book. It applies to all we do today. Second Peter one or second Peter one three A. According as his divine power hath given unto us. Yes. That's a big claim. He gave us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Well, it's a big book. Not as big as some, but certainly bigger than most. And then the message is much more important. How will you know if it's true if you never even open the book to see what it says? And many people make the judgment it ain't true without ever having looked at it because of things other people have said about it. A person with a great deal of love in their heart said those words to me many years ago, and here I am still opening the book to dig out those truths that God said, he, and, and I'm still learning. You're never too old to learn, especially with God. He'll always, you want him to teach you things, he will. These were normal. Excuse me. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, 
and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. This verse is talking about people in Thessalonica, which was a city in Macedonia where Paul and Silas or Silius were, uh, they were there for two to three weeks and ended up having to leave the city because they had taught the word of God so successfully that many of the religions were losing their followers and they became jealous and decided to kill Paul and Silas. So, so they escaped to a town called Berea where they went right back to teaching the Bible. These men and women were called more noble because they searched the scriptures to see if Paul was telling them the truth. They wanted to know Paul knew what he was talking about. Okay. That is a truth for you to live by. Never blindly accept it when someone says something is from the Bible. Make sure, make them show it to you. I don't care if they have a PhD in religion. If they say something's in the Bible, then make them show it to you. I'll never forget the first person to ever tell me that was my mother. And she's a good part of the reason that I'm here. Okay, let's see here. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus said that the scriptures testify about him. So if the Hebrew scriptures are in the Hebrew scriptures, they are all in some way talking about Jesus Christ. He read all the Hebrew scriptures. He had to figure out what it meant about him. We do the same. <coughs> Isaiah 26.3 Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. A stayed minds means set upon. Like you said, a speaker upon a shelf. It could be resting upon. We rest our minds on the word of God. We need no more support than the word of God. How much can we rely on the word of God? Well, let's see what God thinks about his word. Psalm 138.2 I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for the thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified the word above thy name god magnified his word above his name and that's a pretty awesome thing to because god's got a pretty good name that is how important god thinks his word is isaiah 50 verse 7 for the Lord will help me, therefore I shall not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. <coughs> and I know that he shall I know that I shall not be ashamed. A flint is one of the hardest stones there is. If you hit a flint with a hammer, you get sparks. That's how strong it is. It's one of the strongest. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to set our faces like a flint. Just look in there and see what the word says. And then just grab hold of it and don't let it go. Now, you have to remain humble because maybe you've got something wrong. But all in all, hold on to that word and keep it in your mind. Uh, flint is very hard stone. It's used to lake, make sparks, which causes wick that is soaked in uh, flammable liquid to catch fire. The f and you can also use this uh, to start a, uh, a campfire if you've got the right equipment with it. A flint, if, you mind, if your mind is stayed on God, 
won't move no matter what kind of a rock you throw at it. It will bounce off. <coughs> the flint will be unaffected by the rock thrown at the flint. It may even break, but the flint stays in place. Read the scriptures. Do as they say and rest your mind upon God and never waver. One more thing that applies to these, one more thing, apply these scriptures that you read to your life. Let's look at one of the promises contained in God's word. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as other believers which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in God, Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or the, the word should actually in current language be uh, translated pro, precede, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice and the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's something. If you have been saved already with and are with are already if you if you've been saved and you pass away and you're already with God, then why would God need to say that the people who are left won't precede those who are dead? If you're already dead and with God, this would be a contradiction. This is called our hope. It's supposed to be what motivates us. This is what we this is where we get our rewards. All the crowns and rewards are handed out at this point. And to find out about the crowns, you need to go to 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10, and uh, just keep reading through the rest of that paragraph. Let's see if we can find out more about our hope. 1 Corinthians 14, or 15 uh, has a great chapter about this exact subject. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and which ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which ye are also saved. Now, to, this is covered in Rome, this part right here, by which ye are saved, is covered in Romans 10, 9, and 10, where it tells you how to get saved. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If we keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered, for I delivered first unto you First of all, that which I received, how the Lord Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again in the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren once, of whom which the greater part remain with us unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that... He was seen of James and all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born do, out of due season. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. <coughs> but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than ye all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was within me. Therefore, whether it, 
I were, therefore, whether it were I or those who, or they, so we preached and the word you, and you believed it. Christ died to pay for our sins. He paid the full price by dying for us. If you remember in Genesis, God said, the day you eat from the tree, you will die. He instituted animal substitution that day. They ate from the tree. The animal skins had to come from somewhere. Animal sacrifice for people's sins continued until the death and resurrection of the Savior. He paid the price by sacrificing himself. He was the perfect sacrifice. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there will be no resurrection of the dead? And if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain, for your faith is also in vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he, whom he raised not up not, or not up. If so be that ye, they were dead, they rise not. If the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. In other words, they're dead with no hope. There's whatever it is that was their essence is gone completely. It's not sitting someplace. It's just gone. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Pretty clear. Christ was raised from the dead. You know, and if he wasn't, then we're the most miserable of men. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as we, as in Adam we all die, even so Christ shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, after word, they that are Christ that is coming. Okay, so everyone, first and off, it's Jesus Christ got raised. The next will be all the people who died, but who had been saved, who were born again, had salvation, whatever you want to call it. Um, then cometh the end. After we, there it is, set out very plainly. Christ comes back, gathers the church, and then comes the end. When he shall be delivered up to the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Listen to that one. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expect, or it is manifest that he expected, which did not put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son himself, all, himself be subject unto him, God, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So Christ has, once he comes and gets us, his mission isn't complete. There's something called the millennial kingdom. A thousand years of Christ reigning here on earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And once and once he gets through that period and the adversary, the devil, is destroyed. The devil is not in hell watching people burn right now. The devil is actually 
still in heaven. He hasn't fallen yet. Ro um, Revelation talks about him falling. People say, well, that happened back when he uh, revolted against God. Well, there's no record of that happening in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. So um, he will be destroyed at the end, not sitting there in, in some place called hell. He will be thrown, it says, he will be put into the lake of fire. And fire is not a preservative. Fire consumes. He will be consumed in the fire. And we can all stand there cheering. But some men, man will say, how, is, how are the dead raised? And what is the body do they come? Thou fool, thou which so is, is not quickened except it die. You know, you got to bury the seed in the ground. And then it sprouts after it's been buried. When we get buried, it's because we've died. We go to the grave. The rest of it's all uh, Greek, Roman, and uh, Babylonian hookypookism. And it's a shame that more people don't realize that there is nobody any place except in the ground who's died. They're not sitting there in heaven playing golf with their foursome. They're just waiting for the Lord to return. My mother and father both passed away and they're awaiting the Lord's return. They haven't gone any place except to the graveyard in Ash Ashland, Massachusetts. That's where they are. They're not in heaven, they're not in hell. They will be raised and judged. And I believe they were both born again and I'll see them again. Okay. Um, and that which was so sowest, thou sowest not that the body may, shall be the body that sh that shall be, but the grain it may be, have chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth God giveth it a body as he as pleased him and hath and to every seed is his own body all flesh is not the same but there is some kind of flesh of men and another kind of flesh of beasts and another kind for the fish and another kind for the boids there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another there is one glory, one sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For the stars differeth from one another in glory. So also is the resurrection from the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And it is, and, and so it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul. The last man Adam was made a life, was made a quickening spirit. How be that was not the first which is spiritual, but the which is natural, and afterwards, which is spiritual. The first man is of earth, earthy, and the second one is of the Lord from heaven, and in and is the earthy, such as are also they that are earthy, and so is the heavenly. Such are those who are heavenly and as we have become as we have borne the image of the earth 
Um, we also bear the image of heaven. Like now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show unto you a mystery. Now, that word mystery should be secret, I believe. I did not check that today. I should have. <coughs> but I believe it means I show you a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And that's what it said back in Thessalonians, that those who are dead in Christ, it's not that those who are dead in Christ get to heaven first. It says they are raised, and then all of us together, both the living and the dead, go to heaven. Or go to God, or you go to Jesus Christ, and then whatever happens, happens. And that that goes along with a verse in Acts where it says, God is no respecter of persons. If you get to see God one more a blink of an eye more than I do, then God's a respecter of persons. He respects you more than me. But that's not the case. The, let, the trumpet sounds, we all go up together, the dead and the living, the, and the dead get uh, new bodies, and we get changed, and those of us who are living get changed. And we meet the Lord in the air. That's what, it talk, that's what it means when it says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have been put on incorruption and the mortals, mortals shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I love that. Who here can say they haven't been touched by death of someone? I just told you my parents both are dead. I've also got other relatives who've passed away and people I've known. And they're going to get up again. The vast majority of them, I believe, will get up again. And I will see them at the gathering together again for the first time in many years. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast. Be that flint. Be steadfast, just not being moved. Just think about that. I'm going to be that flint. I'm going to set my face like that flint, and I'm going to just be totally unmovable. I'm going to stick to the word of God no matter what happens, no matter what comes up. I'm with God, and he's with me. And unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what we need to be doing. we got to be working for God. God has a lot of things he needs done. And our response should be, here am I, Lord. Send me. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we do for God, Mike taught on this last week, it's not in vain. 
we get rewarded. And we should always remember that, that, you know, God doesn't ask us to do something for nothing. And whatever you feel, you may, have, if you're, if you get into the work of the Lord and whatever you feel you might have sacrificed, you'll be paid back a hundredfold for it. And I just want you to remember that, that no matter how bad you may think things are, it is, you will not, I repeat, you will not be left high and dry. God will repay the effort in those rewards that we, and you can read about, like I said about that before, you can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10, going through the paragraph for the rest of the chapter. I forget which it is. So in any case, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you that we can stand as your children. We can take the assignments you want us to do and go do them. And we will be well rewarded for what we do. And Father, I just lift to you Mike and Don and John and Dana, and I thank you for all of them. They are such a blessing in my life. And I thank you, Father, for just watching over them and uh, just being the great and loving Father you are. And I thank you for this in your son's name. Now, you. That's it. There we go. You are going away. And I got a hand cramp. We are staying right here. We'll see you in fellowship after hours.